Well, welcome back to another episode of Finance Uncut. On today's episode, we look at part two of my investment thesis. We finished off part one on this slide, which is the commodity index. And uh, you can see this goes back to 1999 and commodity uh, have never been this cheap. So I like commodities. Um, I've actually got a, another chart that actually goes the commodity index that goes back to 1900. And there's only one other time that uh, commodities, maybe two if you, if you want to push it. There's only been one, maybe two other times that commodities have been this cheap uh, on the commodity index. And so... Uh, I'll get into it shortly about um, uh, how I'm putting together a portfolio. I just want to finish off my macro thoughts from part one. Uh, so as we go along, uh, gold's last market. So, you know, a lot of people have been writing off gold in the last, you know, month, last two months as gold has pulled back a little bit. Um, but what people who don't understand uh, gold is in the last um, bull run uh, between 2000 and 2011, where it went from you know, $250 to $2,000 or thereabouts. Um, gold had significant pullbacks uh, along the way. Um, one at almost 29% there um, during the, the, the middle of the global financial crisis. So, um, no, I'm still very, very bullish gold and even more bullish silver. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So I, in part one, I talked about um, the dollar um, and that we've got this record level uh, of shorts, uh, shorting the US dollar. And look, based on those shorts, the US dollar should be further, further down. I think this could be over... Um, you know, it's a it's a crowded um, bet, and um, look, one one thing is, I um, that great when it comes to uh, trading currencies. I've got lucky in the past. I've probably shared in other videos where I basically sold my silver in two thousand eleven, moving it at you know almost. Um, you know, the, the top, not quite the top, moving into 2012 uh, when our Aussie dollar was above parity. Uh, I, I transferred funds over. I know it hit $1.10 at one point, but I transferred funds over to the States at $1.05 and $1.04 and $1.03 um, and bought uh, US property uh, right at the bottom of the, of the um, bear market in, in the US property market. Now, to be honest, that was all luck. Um, I did not time that. I did not think, you know, I'm hitting the bottom, I'm buying the top, you know, all this sort of stuff. That was pure luck. Um, and so whenever I've looked at trading currencies and, uh, you know, people ask me, what do you think the currency is going to do? Um, you know, I'll have an opinion and it seems to do the exact opposite. So perhaps what I say in this uh, video, maybe, maybe you want to take the opposite play here. So, but anyway, I've kind of stopped. Um, looking at it from my own perspective. My own perspective is, yeah, I'd be shorting the US dollar as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it, it would collapse, um, ultimately collapse. However, when I listen to people like Jeff Snyder and Brent Johnson, um, you know, and they talk about the euro dollars, so the dollars outside of the US and the, and the US de denominated debts, um, so the demand for dollars, and we saw that spike, and you can see in this chart back in March that the US dollar spiked dramatically. Um, uh, you know, Brent Johnson, uh, with his dollar milkshake theory, he thinks there's going to be another uh, demand for dollars uh, in the next uh, nasty little period, and, and that the dollar index will actually spike. In fact, he's shorted the Australian dollar. He thinks, and he said to me that he thinks the Aussie dollar is going sub 40. Not sub 50, not sub 60, sub 40. Um, 
I asked him when does he think that's going to happen. He thinks late 2021, maybe 2022. Um, and so that's what he thinks. Uh, personally, I hope he's right, but I hope he's right a lot earlier uh, just for some potential trades that I've got. But um, So he thinks that. Now, when we actually have a look at the dollar debt, that foreign investors and dollar trade invoicing uh, outside uh, the US, so this is this whole euro dollar uh, emerging markets, even China uh, and other countries, uh, the dollar denominated debt, that the, that's the US dollar denominated liabilities have skyrocketed. So there is a demand for US dollars. Remember trade is done in US dollars now. Uh, if things really blow up, could the world uh, just, just completely go off the US dollar and just go, no, nah, we're not doing it. We're, we're going to trade you know, between Australia and India or, or Australia and, and Japan. We're going to just trade between the Australian dollar and the yen or um, you know, what, what will happen there. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Brent Johnson and, uh, and Jeff Snyder are right and that the dollar will actually rise. Um, Jim Rogers, one of my favorite all-time investors, billionaire uh, is holding US dollars. He hates US dollars. He says they, that they are, they are rubbish, uh, like all fiat currencies. But he did say, um, you know, in times of trouble, when we go into, you know, deep, deep recessions, when things go to blow up, then there is a mad rush for dollars. People are selling assets to get their hands on dollars because they need dollars to pay their liabilities to, to stay solvent and uh and so he's holding dollars because he thinks that the dollar will go up uh, the, the the us dollar i'm talking about and uh but he said he thinks it might even move into a bubble and he'll sell so he doesn't want to hold these us dollars for too long he's just waiting for the next little play and maybe with what jeff snyder and brent johnson are talking about maybe maybe they're right maybe Maybe they're right. Um, I personally, I hope they are right because that's good news for me. So the M1 money supply, uh, you can see, you can see where it's gone in 2020. Um, I think in previous videos I've talked about uh, this and talked about the amount of currency that's been uh, created just this year alone compared to rest of history in terms of the percentages. It's quite staggering. In Australia similar thing so australia's uh, you know been so this is a broad broad currency supply i hate using the word money supply it's not money it's currency it's debt it's debt that's all it is uh it's, it, the only value it's got is faith that we can exchange it some goods and services but it loses value every single year so we need more of it by the same stuff and you can see here that the our broad currency supply is spiking right towards the end there and look once again uh, the our central bank i think from a data i saw they're about the fifth or sixth um, largest central bank in terms of their monthly uh, qe program so their, their constant asset purchase program uh, you've got the fed and the ecb clearly one and two you've got uh, boj bank of japan I think the ECB, uh, and then it actually might be oh no, then then China, and then and then uh, the RBA Australia. So so you know we're we're doing quite a bit. So this will continue to run, and uh, as our government continues to um, do the big deficit spending, the big stimulus stuff that we're doing, the massive uh, yeah, as I said, deficit spending, then that's going to be more. Currency going into the back pockets of households and businesses, which goes into the broad money supply, which is deposits at the commercial banks. We're seeing a demand for inflation protection, so tips, um, and you can see that there. So, as 2020 back in March, obviously, you know, it was everyone was afraid of deflation. You know, everything collapsing in, and so there was that rush for for dollars and and treasury bonds, you know, um, 
And but since then, uh, you can see that uh, you know people, big funds, um, you know even central banks are now starting to buy uh, inflation protected securities. Uh, I know this isn't a great graph, and it's uh, the the eurozone here, but it's just the PMI and the M1 currency supply again. So the currency supply going up while the PMI or the economy is going uh, backwards, uh, really. And so what this sets up for me is stagflation. Now, those of you who know stagflation will understand the misery index. Though, If you haven't heard of the misery index, just go and Google it. You'll see the misery index uh, basically was the worst during the stagflation periods in the 70s where you stagflation, you, you have uh, high inflation, um, you have high unemployment and low growth. So you have a weak economy uh, and you know high unemployment and uh, high inflation or high CPI. So look, this chart is from, um, uh, from an Austrian economist who's actually a deflationist, uh, a deflationist. So he's not an inflationist at all. He's been uh, he's been bearish on gold. In fact, he's had a gold call of $800 an ounce. Uh, he's been warning people all year gold's going to crash down to $800 an ounce. So no, this is not an inflationist whatsoever. But uh, he's just released this chart. Now, he thinks we are here, okay? Uh, by the way, this is supposed to be production. So this, this axis here is production. This axis here is price. Uh, so he says we're here. He says that we're moving into deflation. Uh, and then as we get, you know, companies go bankrupt uh, and we have supply chain issues, then what happens is we go along this axis of less production, uh, but ultimately higher prices. So we, we are here, he says, we're moving into deflation over the next several months before we move into a more inflationary period due to bankruptcies and supply chain interruptions, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, but then with the constant government, and you know, this says US stimulus package, but it, it could be Australia, it could be any, any country around the world, with the stimulus package uh, and the you know, move towards you know, MMT and just governments fiscally spending directly into the economy, then we will move to stagflation. And it's funny because all the deflationists also say, so whether, whether you're looking at a... Stephen Van Meter, Jeff Snyder, Brent Johnson, Harry Dan. They all say deflation first, then inflation, or stagflation, or some some form of inflation. Um, you know, I I was on that train as well earlier this year. Um, you know, a lot of them compare now to 1929 and the 1930s. Problem with that is back then we were on a gold standard. So central banks and governments were restricted in what they could do in credit creation. Now we're under a fiat system. The government literally wanted to um, you know, print up $100 trillion tomorrow. Uh, well, they don't. They create bonds. Um, through the primary dealers, the central banks then purchase those, uh, those bonds. So, so the central banks create the currency units. And then the treasury uh, gets to go spend it. So if they wanted to do that, if they wanted inflation tomorrow, they could do that. Um, the push with MMT is to merge treasury and the central bank together so that effectively you cut out the, the primary dealers, you cut out the commercial banks, and you just, you just um, you know, the treasury and the, the central bank works together in spending directly into the economy. Because the MMT is saying, well, we didn't get inflation in 2008, and since then when we've done QE, Problem is QE or quantitative easing, and you can look at any chart. You know they're not the brightest people. These MMTs. You can look at any chart. Uh, quantitative easing is simply bank reserves. So the so the Federal Reserve creates or, or central banks create bank reserves which sit at the central bank account. Um, so they buy uh, government bonds, mortgage-backed securities, um, and now just about any other asset. But pretty much just those. Um, two assets um, over the last decade or since the GFC. Uh, so they take those. So it's a bit like an asset swap, sort of. 
except the, uh, the, the central banks will take those assets, mortgage-backed securities and, and treasuries, create uh, bank reserves which are held at the Fed. So they stay within the banking system. They don't go out into the real economy unless banks create new loans. Now, banks during that time period, you can have a look at any data, any graph, they have not been creating loans in a big way, lending it out to mum and pop, you know, uh, lending it out to consumers, households, and small businesses. Where have they been lending? They've been lending to government. They've been buying um, you know, treasuries there. You look at the bank's balance sheets, you know, that's where they've been lending. So they have been lending. They've been lending to government because, you know, via taxpayers, that's the customer. And ultimately, hey, look, central bank will buy these assets off us if they don't go so well. Uh, if the taxpayers revolt, um, so uh, so that's and, and so it never got into the real economy. So yeah, we didn't have inflation, but it stayed within the banking system. So what did what did we get? We we got asset price inflation. We got stock market, bonds, uh, even real estate, and so we had massive inflation in these areas. And it's the Cantillon effect. Those of you you don't understand the Cantillon effect, it was uh, Richard. It's his name's it. it His na name's spelt Richard Cantillon, uh, but it's Richard Cantillon. And, uh, and it's really about where new created currency goes to. And when it's first injected, uh, then those people benefit the most. So where you've got Wall Street that have got all that uh, you know, funding, uh, companies getting uh, you know, funds, buying back their own stock. Well, they're the ones that get that. They benefit from that price inflation where everybody else um, that aren't holding those assets or don't um, get that newly created currency uh, are in some trouble. So where am I? Oh, and then here's the other issue. So the BIS issues a dire warning. We're moving from the liquidity to the solvency phase of the crisis. You know, in Australia, trading while insolvent uh, moratorium happening. So you, people can trade while insolvent at the moment. That ends in December, the end of December. So next year, um, you know, we're going to see a lot of small to medium enterprises going under. The problem is they've been allowed to trade this year while insolvent, doing businesses with other solvent companies and businesses. Now, they're likely not to be paying their bills. And when they go under in the, in the new year, potentially going to put financial stress and pain on good companies that were solvent and perhaps bring down other companies that didn't need to be. The one thing I hated about the Morrison government's um, everything they've done, the one thing that really made me angry was this. Because you're risking good quality companies because you're allowing bad companies to operate. That is bad. That is bad economics. That is, that is dumb, ScoMo. But I'll... Leave it at this. I thought this was well said on, on Twitter. My friend, debt is the very essence of fiat. As debt defaults, fiat is destroyed. This is where all these deflationists get their direction. Not seeing that hyperinflation is a process of saving debt at all costs, even buying it outright for cash. Now, in the US, they're talking about uh, student loan forgiveness. That's what this is talking about. Or saving debt at all costs. So earlier this year, we saw that central banks and governments wouldn't allow the system to deflate. They wouldn't allow people to go under, companies to go under, uh, people to default, people to go bankrupt. Uh, you know, if you create currency, that's inflation. But when you either pay back debt or you default on debt, you're destroying currency, that's deflation. Um, deflation is impossible in today's dollar terms because policy will allow the printing of cash, if necessary, to cover every last bit of debt and dumping it on your front lawn. Worthless dollars, of course, but no deflation in dollar terms. And that's an interesting thing because that's the difference between now and back in 1929 and the 30s. Um, right now, central banks and governments are intervening into every market in every aspect of the economy and they will not allow deflation. And under a fiat system, they can create as much fiat as they like. So just quickly, I want to finish this off. So just the first six months of 2020, uh, the household debt accumulation, China. Look, China's the biggest debt bubble in the world. 
Uh, people say China's going to be the next global superpower. Uh-uh, uh-uh. China have the worst demographics behind Japan. Uh, their demographics peaked, uh, what, 2011, and they go down right through to 2050 and beyond. Uh, they've got a massive debt bubble. Their central planning economy is going to collapse. It's only a, a matter of when, so forget China. All right, so also the latest data on home loans in Australia, the September quarter. So you can see unoccupied up 22%. That's huge. So uh, once again, our government here has intervened, intervened in the market, just jumped in, uh, provided all sorts of uh, grants and um, inducements. And, and look, uh, you know, we, we own a finance brokerage business, mortgage broking business. And um, back in June, we were receiving two to three inquiries from first home buyers a day. Uh, and when we chat to these first home buyers, uh, basically, um, you know, it's the FOMO or, or, or it's they feel this is their only chance to get in uh, by using both state federal grants say so potentially forty thousand dollars or forty five if they go to a regional area worth of grants as well as a lot of them you know, pulled super money out of super uh, so ten thousand dollars each prior to the financial year and ten thousand dollars each after so that's uh twenty thousand dollars each so if it's a couple that's forty thousand dollars there plus forty thousand dollars in grant so that's eighty thousand dollars so a lot of people feel this is the only opportunity they'll ever be able to buy a home is to take advantage of this. Now, a lot of these people have got pretty ordinary employment, I must say. Very weak employment. But the banks have lent them money. Um, so we're seeing that. Uh, investment lending uh, up 13%. That surprises me. Uh, interest only. There's a couple of things that worry me about this uh, as well, which I'll mention in a sec. So interest only, 21%. Uh, LVR is greater than 95, so the high LVR stuff increased. That this is your first home buyers, 35 percent. Third party originator, that's brokers, that's us, 30 30 percent, uh, and debt to income higher than six times. That's six times income to the debt, up 29 percent. So everybody is leveraging up at this point. Scomo has uh, made credit to the guy. He has been a champion at bringing forward demand bringing forward demand from the future to now uh, everyone's buying now everyone's building now we're getting you know I've, i shared in the in part one you know the construction for new homes just skyrocketing just going going vertical um but what concerns me here is interest only up 21 percent. okay so this tells me there's a lot of owner occupiers who have switched from pni to interest only why they're struggling we got high LVRs, so very low deposits, massively grown. Not much fat in, in that at all. Get the income over six times, up almost 30%. You know, that, that, that's a concern. So what we're doing is we're leveraging up at these record low interest rates. And if I'm right and we get this CPI increase, guess what's going to happen to interest rates just around the corner, folks? That's right. That's right. And what a central bank's going to do? Here's the argument. No, central banks won't allow interest rates to rise. Yeah, maybe. Uh, what will happen, and we're already seeing it, is yields are starting to rise on bonds. Um, and when that bond market does pop and go belly up, because there's, what, almost $20 trillion of uh, negative uh, yielding bonds in the world, it's insane. It's the biggest bubble I've ever seen. Um, yeah, the central bank, the only buyers, when people, when, when interest rates, yields start going up, everyone's going to be wanting to sell their bonds because the bonds are going to be falling. Uh, problem is, who's going to be buying it? The only potential buyers is central banks. So what the central banks will do is create more inflation, <clears throat> more currency units. What? To fight inflation. So they're creating more inflation to fight inflation. Yep. We got some smart ones. Uh, okay, so here we've got nominal versus real returns um, for property. Um, so nominal, and this is what people don't understand, the difference between nominal and real. Uh, folks, if the one thing you, you, you get out of all my videos that I do is learn about the difference between nominal and real returns. Um, I love explaining this to people and seeing their heads explode. 
Um, but for example, here, look at Brisbane. So in the last 10 years, Brisbane's been pretty weak, but you know, properties have gone up 11.7%. Yay! But in real returns, you've lost money. What? How's that happened, Steve? Inflation, folks. Inflation. So you've got nominal and you've got real. But what I really want to point out is this. So we have a look at the, the, the price gains of property, but have a look at just the big four. Have a look at the mortgage debt growth. So the price growth versus the mortgage debt growth. And here's just a from the Commonwealth Bank to show that mortgage growth uh, happening there. So here, uh, Australian wages in the last decade up 31%. The last two decades up 102%. Australian house price growth in the last decade up 30%, so not as much as wages. Um, over the last two decades, uh, up 176%. Okay, Australian mortgage debt growth in the last decade up nearly 61%. Mortgage debt up 565%. And this is Dr. Lacey Hunt, the Keynesian. He's a Keynesian. Okay? Um, even he, and they're the ones that are like, you know, fiscal spending, you know, let's let's pump more, pump more, get asset prices up. People will feel wealthy, so they'll borrow against that and go and spend into the economy. Even Dr. Lacey Hunt says that we get to a point, and we're already at that point, where once upon a time when you'd go and borrow a, a dollar, you'd get a dollar or maybe a dollar ten in GDP growth or, or economic output. He says now for every dollar we, we, we borrow, we get about 25 cents back in, in our economic output. So we, we you know, Jason Burak from Wall, uh, Wall Street to Main Street says that our economy is a Ponzi scheme and uh, we need to continue to increase the debt exponentially just to keep the economy upright. Um, in fact, I think it's him, it might be someone else, uses the example that our economy, property market, everything is a patient on life support. And it's the governments and central banks that are keeping the patient, in this case, the economy alive. And this is why we're not having the deflation, that the deflationists for the last decade have been preaching. We haven't had it because governments and central banks won't allow it. They won't allow the free market to work. We should have deflation. We should have price falls. Uh, we should have creative destruction. That's part of capitalism. If you don't have it, then you don't have capitalism anymore. 5.2 trillion and 5 million. The first number is how much the US stock market rose for the first of the year. The second is the increase in the number of unemployed people over that same period. So folks, <laughs> asset prices are going up when we're in the worst pandemic of our lifetimes, the worst uh, uh, economic uh, you know, recession since the Great Depression, and we've got asset prices going ballistic. This should tell you something that it's got nothing to do with fundamental. Shared this chart in part um, part one that between fifty two and eighty eight, uh, the source of stock market gains was from you know predominantly economic growth, ninety two percent from economic growth, and so you had fundamentals. Um, since nineteen eighty nine. Uh, only 24% uh, of stock market gains has been attributed to economic growth. And in 2020, I would say that's, well, zero, negative, whatever you want to say. Um, so it's all about liquidity, but it's also about this. So we're seeing a lot of um, new traders, young traders uh, into the market using all these fancy little platforms, the Robin Hood kids, uh, they're, they're known as. And I've met a lot of young people who have got these new trading platforms. And, um, yeah, they're showing me that, oh, yeah, I'm trading this and I'm trading options. Well, what's an option? Oh, I don't know. It's just this thing that everyone's doing. Um, yeah, and I'm trading this thing. It's called a CFD. I'm like, you know what a CFD stands for? Nah, but it's pretty cool, man. Like, um, they got no idea what they're doing. Um, the, the, the stock market's become a casino. and you can see the small trades, which is less than 10 contracts, um, is just absolutely skyrocketing uh, since since March. Or, you know, in April, uh, it has really, really exploded. And uh, and that's another factor that's pushing up uh, the, the stock market. So it's got nothing to do with the fundamentals. 
So uh, before I get to uh, my outlook and putting together my portfolio, I wanted to share my stock scorecard for this year. Okay, so I blacked out or, or just X'd out uh, the ticket codes for uh, for the stocks that I own because you know we don't give advice on this channel. Uh, we don't give financial advice or investment advice. Uh, we just we just chat. We just talk about things. You'd be an idiot to listen to me. Uh, you know, so you know, obviously, always go see your own financial uh, planner and get your own financial advice done. So I've just X'd out those codes because I don't want to encourage anyone to go and buy the, those stocks. Um, look, a couple of these stocks, I've got two, two um, slides here. A couple of these stocks I've since sold out of. Uh, the rest I still own. Uh, look, I may in the next little while um, take some profits on some of these. Uh, so, you know, once again, uh, you know, if I was to put up the stocks that I had, you go and buy it, I then go sell. I mean, you know, you'll be pretty dirty. Um, but these are my positions um, that I've had this year, and I'll talk a little bit about you know what kind of industries and that that they they're in. Um, and this is more of my position. So my average return uh, this year on the stock market has been two hundred and eighty eight point one percent. That's not including uh, the put options that we. I think it was the third of March we bought put options, held them for definitely no more than three weeks. It might have been about two and a half weeks where we made 780% return. Um, uh, so some of my uh, turtles from the Real Money School uh, watch this channel. My students, my um, economic students, um, uh, one of them was in my office when I was placing these option trades. So uh, he got to see, and I had some technical issues. So uh, the trades actually didn't go through straight away. And so those returns could have actually been about 1,000%. Um, but he got to see a very frustrated Steve when I was trying to uh, place those trades back back in in March. I think it was the third of March from memory. That that rings a bell. Um, but also my other my other students in my real money school class, uh, they know what stocks these are. Uh, you know, some of them have bought these stocks, and, and some of them have got these similar returns as well. Uh, so my turtles out there uh if you're watching this video and listening um comment down below um don't use the uh ticker codes or the stock names uh because we don't want to be encouraging anyone to rush out and buy particular investments and whatnot uh these returns also exclude um you know the returns that we've got on our cash flow properties and also our precious metals so i think our gold precious metals uh I'd probably be up around 50% uh, from when we bought. Maybe actually, maybe a little bit less than that. Now, uh, our silver would be up around 80, 80 to 90%. Uh, we bought silver quite cheap. Um, well, thanks for joining me for part two of my investment thesis. Uh, the video actually went too long, so we've cut it into two. So part three will be out tomorrow. Uh, so stay tuned for that because I'll go into detail about sectors that I'm invested in, the sectors that I'm looking to invest in, the different markets that I see opportunities in the uh, next a little while, and perhaps how you can uh, take advantage of that as well. So stay tuned, part three tomorrow.